experience. We don't want to say that something works definitely and then have you have a, an experience that you don't want to have. Great. Thank you very much. Last lecture, you've been a fantastic crowd. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you again. the uh, boat this afternoon for those of you going on the uh, sail with the professor so you can continue to uh, pick his brain about OB anesthesia, the management of peripheral catheters, I mean, of uh, interaxial catheters and the like. Uh, I could say my take home point for this lecture here is that rather than listen to me, you should go out to the beach. <laughs> uh, I'm John Ellison, your course director. I'm adjunct professor in the Department of Anesthesia and critical care uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I have some conflicts of interest. Uh, I do some lecture work with Baxter. Uh, I run these programs here. And at the very end, for those of you who know me a long time when I was bigger, I'll talk to you about how I managed to get smaller. So there's some conflicts of interest there, I suppose. Uh, and, and I start this with, uh, with sort of two statements uh, that sometimes we pay attention to and sometimes we don't. I realize that not everyone in the room is a physician, but this is a sort of famous quote, physician, heal thyself. And also, put on your own oxygen mask first. They told you that when you flew down here. Comes down first, you got someone with you you're taking care of, put your own, your own on first so that you can render care to the people who depend upon you. And of course, we don't always pay attention to this uh, in daily life. Uh, as far as the issue of physicians, a lot of the data I will present in this lecture relates to physicians because that's the, the data that we have. But I think we can certainly extrapolate uh, to people who are clinicians in practice and from anesthesiologists to nurse anesthetists as well. And so I'm going to present some scholarship and also some personal experience with stress and burnout. Uh, and since I haven't died yet, I won't share my personal experience about mortality, but I will tell you what some of the literature says about mortality in anesthesiologists. I will talk about some of the occupational risk of anesthesia practice, which I've been uh, unfortunate enough to experience. And lastly, summarize talking about some tools uh, to combat stress uh, and reduce chronic disease. Well, what causes stress and burnout in healthcare professionals? You know all these things. One of these are production pressure. And it seems like that production pressure just gets ratcheted up every year. I can remember finishing my residency at UVA in 1986. And the model of an attending anesthesiologist at that time was, first of all, cases were long. They'd kind of saunter in the room, start the case, go back to their office, come back. They'd take call from home. Even an academic attending anesthesiologist is far more involved. I would do cases as a resident at night by myself. My fellow resident would hold quite, quite, quite pressure and go back to OB or the ICU. That's unimaginable today. So the production pressure, the expectation of perfection uh, for what we do. I mean, people say, well, cardiac anesthesia is hard. It is. Patients have gotten older, gotten sicker. Ambulatory anesthesia is hard. People expect perfection in that realm. If I'm doing a thoracic aneurysm and someone gets a tooth chipped, big deal. Right? Someone's coming in for plastic surgery, they get a tooth chip, that is a tragedy. By the way, I will tell you, for those of you who are teaching, plastic surgery is a wonderful opportunity in the university to teach elective fiber optic intubation. And the story goes like this. Why are you taking so damn long doing a fiber optic intubation in my patient? Because, Dr. Plastic Surgeon, we would never want to chip your patient. Just take all the time you want. Thank you. Take all the time you want. But production pressure is an issue. And then every so often we have the bad outcomes uh, that can be problematic. Financial issues can be a source of stress, uh, personal issues, uh, and then you know, this whole issue of call and work hours and irregularity uh, can be problematic. Now, Gavin and colleagues reported two types of uh, work stress that people uh, reported in terms of uh, production pressure. And one was internal pressure. We place pressure upon ourselves to be excellent in what we do. And then there are external pressure. The surgeon, hospital administration, uh, your chair. Is Dr. Todd in the room here? Is he out walking around? Who runs their group in the room here? Okay, so those of you who are, you know, right? External production pressure. Now, in terms of the pressure that respondents said they placed on themselves, they were hires, number one, to avoid delays to surgery. Uh, number two, to avoid litigation and to get along with surgeons. These are, now they may be internalized, but the, 
these are what people said they put pressure on themselves to do, to do these things. Now, the external pressure, not surprisingly, from surgeons to proceed with the case rather than cancel. So when we talk about these issues of glucose and what glucose do you cancel, these are the things that can be stressful when you think, I don't know if I should be doing this, but, uh, and, and I think sometimes it's easier when you're salaried to make these decisions. But these can be sources of pressure. And then from administrators to reduce turnover time. Uh, by the way, don't use any expensive drugs, right? Use the cheap drugs for faster turnover time, right? So you get now these conflicting uh, things that come upon you. Now, interestingly here, 63% of the respondents, this is a British survey, so you say now, in, the Brits are for the most part all salaried government employees, perhaps unionized, and yet they still describe these same pressures that we have in a more, in a more private system. 63% of respondents suggest that they have made errors because of their workload. Now, I won't ask people to raise their hands here, but you can certainly identify with this, that there's a balance between perfect practice and efficiency. Now, what is burnout? We all have some sense of burnout. Things that we see associated with this are depression, anxiety, suicide. And this is particularly a, an issue amongst anesthesiologists, broken relationships with family, friends, and colleagues, addiction, and we'll certainly talk about that among anesthesia providers, a marital dysfunction, divorce, and early retirement. A professional disengagement, poor judgment, and patient care decision making. 63% of people said they made errors. How about this? How many of you have found yourself regretting later having been hostile towards a patient? I certainly have. Right? You're tired, someone's giving you a hard time, you're barking back at them. Uh, that's not giving medical errors, adverse patient events. Diminished commitment and dedication to optimal patient care. People no longer become Mrs. Johnson. This is now the coli, right? This is the hip. You have depersonalization and perhaps difficult relationships with coworkers. Now, this is a study in academic faculty, so it may not quite uh, translate to private practice, but looked at what are the predictors of people having burnout in academic faculty. And one of the things they found is that if you spent less than 20% on the most meaningful activity to you, you were more likely to have burnout. Now, for different people, that may be different. So Dr. Downingham runs the group, right? She's, she's the boss, and maybe she loves that. Maybe she works in the OR less than other people. She probably works more, but anyway, you know, if she loves doing that administrative role, she's less likely to be burnt out. On the other hand, if she is forced into that role, doesn't like it, wish she could be back in the OR providing care, she is more likely to be burned out. Now, interestingly enough, young people were more likely to be burned out. Maybe that's because people graduate in the group, and now I'm over 55, I don't take call anymore, or I have my younger colleagues, I, I pay them to take my call, or whatever. But older folks seem to have uh, less issues with burnout. Ge generalists, and this is again an academic faculty, more burnout, the more specialized people were. And this is something one of my mentors told me. Uh, David Longneck, who went on to be chair of anesthesia at Penn, said, you know, if you are acknowledging your institution as expert at something, you may be the regional block guru, you may be the pediatric anesthesiologist guru, even if you do other stuff, then having respect from your colleagues for having particular expertise, uh, he said, would contribute to career satisfaction. We see the people who do everything seem to have more burnout. And not surprisingly, the more people work, the more likely they were to experience burnout in their careers. And we see this here, that burnout seems to be predicted. This is in the surgical uh, literature. If you look at things that happen with people at burnout, we see burnout is associated with twice the likelihood of making perceived medical errors. So this is self-report. If you are burned out, you are more likely to make medical errors. Now, interestingly, the next one is that retired people make less medical errors. Well, I would hope they would make less medical errors. I mean, I don't quite understand that. Dr. Plastic surgeon, never wrong, never makes errors. Okay? This is self-report. Um, if you're spending more of your time doing non-patient care, you're less likely to have burnout. So maybe, Martha, you're doing the right thing, right? Uh, age, again, you see as older people less likely to have burnout, and if you are depressed, and again, these things can feed on each other, if you're depressed, you're more likely to report medical errors. Now, one of the questions is, what is cause uh, and, 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 and what is effect? And one of the things that may cause depression and burnout, and then set you up for more problems to having perioperative uh, catastrophes or lawsuits, and I've certainly uh, been uh, victim, as it were, of these. So, uh, these are folks uh, 
uh, from the University of Virginia did a survey looking at perioperative catastrophes amongst anesthesiologists in the national survey. And they asked people in this survey, with certain outcomes, a catastrophe. And interestingly enough, 70% of people said that death was not a catastrophe. Now, I suppose if you have an ASA 5 and, you know, you could say it's not a catastrophe. That's very interesting to me that 70% of people would say that death was not cardiac arrest, MI, intraoperative awareness. Actually, only 38% of people thought that death was a catastrophe. A nerve injury, we heard about some. Only about a third. Seizure. Now, stroke, 75%. Perioperative visual loss, only 67% thought that was a catastrophe. I guess if it's only one eye, it's not so bad. I mean, give me a break. I don't know. What are the wrong site surgery? Only 66%. Now, I know in vascular surgery, when you're doing the foot amputation and it makes the news, it says, Willie King has a wrong foot amputated. And I said to myself, I want to see both of Willie King's feet. Because <laughs> my guess is that Willie King needed both of those feet amputated at some point. But obviously, if someone's having an nephrectomy and the wrong kidney is taken out, that's a problem. And yet, only two-thirds of people, uh, anesthesiologists, responded that they thought that that would be a catastrophe to do wrong site surgery or wrong patient surgery. How is that not a catastrophe? Nonetheless, that's what was reported there. They also go on to say that having perioperative catastrophes may have a profound and lasting emotional impact on the anesthesiologist involved. It may affect his or her ability to provide care in the aftermath. And certainly that's been my experience. I can think of a, a couple of devastating uh, things that have happened in the ER. When the ASA 5 dies, that is not the problem. It's when you have the ASA 1 or 2 come in and some god-awful thing should happen, that this can really be problematic. Now, when they ask people who had had a serious event, a catastrophe or such, how long did it take you to recover? Some people, 12% said, not me. And you see other people here said it took a day, a week, a month. Some people never fully recovered from a perioperative catastrophe. Never fully recovered. So one would suggest that in this period of time, people may not be, not this guy, but these people here may not be in the best shape to continue to provide care. We ask people, after this bad thing happens, does this impact the quality of your subsequent care? First four hours, two-thirds. At 24 hours and a half, even at a week, a quarter of people say that their ability to provide subsequent care for patients is impaired by having had a perioperative catastrophe. So let me ask you this. However, how do we deal with this? Do we say, you know, Robert, listen, we know you had a bad thing happen. Take the rest of the day off, maybe. Don't come in tomorrow, I doubt it. And who's going to cover you? How would you feel if two days before you were coming to St. Thomas, your group said, you know, please don't go to St. Thomas because Bob needs a week off to recover from an unanticipated intraoperative death. Right? Forget that. So, you know, this is, this, you know, you say, I want to be here. And in fact, this is part of your investing in your wellness, both by having fun out there and actually uh, by, by educating oneself as well. Now, what about financial issues? I think, you know, we are, it's interesting in, in, in times of Occupy Wall Street, the 1%, the 0.1%, and, you know, compared to uh, most of uh, our, our fellow citizens, we're, we're, we're doing fairly well. Everyone can gripe and complain that we wish we were doing better, that we have fears about what's going to come in the future. But it's interesting, I'll show you some data that suggests that these financial concerns diminish over time. So this is a study, now this is Canadian uh, anesthesiologists, and they actually do quite well in Canada. Uh, they're not hurting up in Canada, right? In fact, they're probably doing better than most of us. And you look here, before residency, what are people worried about? Money, marriage, emotional, sexual, clinical competence, okay? During residency, they're still worried about being broke. Now you're working here, and you got to deal with surgeons and nurses and uh, administrators and stuff, you're worried about intrapersonal work relationships. Marital, you see, marital never goes away. That continues to be a source of stress, okay? Uh, emotional and competence. Now, people finish. Lawrence suggested that once they finish, their practice patterns are fossilized, but they're comfortable with those fossilized practice patterns, and you see they're no longer worried about being competent. What are they worried about? They're worried about getting old, 
Okay? They're worried about this interpersonal work. This is some of this stuff. Do I cancel the case? Et cetera, et cetera. Marital malpractice, one can think of this as sort of a, a part of financial, but really you're more concerned about having catastrophe, about being sued, defensive medicine, et cetera. And so financial goes down. And, and so that, you know, you pay off some student loans, you get to feel better about the way you are. And, and that's a good thing. Now, there's an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago about investment advice for doctors, and, it, and, and it, the subtitle is first, do no harm. And this is just one vision of, uh, of what it is. This, this article does a whole series of, uh, of, of case studies of physicians who got fancy with their finances uh, and, and had issues as a result. So this author's point of view is like, look, he says, docs come out of training and they're impatient. Okay? Because they take so long to train, their time to work is less. And people who sell investments and other things see physicians as marked. That we work in a world where we, we talk to our colleagues, we get consultations, we are more trusting than other people in the world. And so we are viewed as easy marks for fancy schemes. And also, if you ask your average, if I, if I would take a show of hands here and ask how many of you think you are better than average uh, clinicians, right? 90% of you would put your hands up. Okay, so we tend to be overconfident. That's part of our training. We are trained to be confident with, our, with what we do. And as a result, we, some of us tend to be suckers for fancy uh, plans. So this pe people say in this article, this one guy is totally saying, he sees no reason for doctors to shoot for the moon. So there's a high barrier to entry in the medical field, and there's a low failure rate. Who knows who this is? Tony Gwynn, all-star baseball player, was the king of hitting singles, right? Wasn't a big home run hitter, but he hit lots of singles, got on base a lot, and got to the Hall of Fame. And the analogy here would be is that, you know, don't get sucked up into who's, who's out of training in the last five years. Okay. So the, the argument would be the folks who just got out of training, you've been suffering, you see your friends who are in other fields and they're living large, you get out, and the banker says, we can give you this big house, we can give you this big car, and you just you want it all now, and you pile on things. Forget all that. Forget all that. You make it up in the long term. All you have to do is systematically put 20% or more of your uh, income aside, these nice, dull investments, and you're set for life. Why kill, why kill yourself to hit grand slams when you've already won the game? Now, that doesn't account for what's going to happen in the future with health care reform, et cetera, et cetera. We understand that the future is not predictable. But the bottom line is that, that financial concerns diminish over time. Personal concerns in personal life, uh, obviously, uh, are something that all folks experience. Issues with call and circadian rhythms are, are significant. We know that sleep deprivation uh, produces uh, increase in stress hormones, increase in eating. Now, this is an issue in America in general. The average American sleeps one to two hours less than they did 50 years ago. And there's a lot of work that's been done by Dr. Van Powder at the University of Chicago that's actually shown if you sleep deprive people, they actually have an increased appetite, particularly for carbs, and that you can actually take healthy undergraduate students, you put them in the CRC for two weeks, and you sleep deprive them, you make them sleep four hours a night, and you test their glucose tolerance, they look like diabetics. Okay? So diabetics are often people who have sleep apnea. There's a vicious cycle that can happen here. But sleep deprivation uh, can produce this, this chronic stress uh, that goes on. Now, one of the things that's been shown, I remember going back and forth to Asia and feeling quite awful and reading about these issues, that pilots who fly across time zones actually end up with smaller temporal lobes. There are actually brain changes that occur with chronic sleep deprivation. Uh, so the issue is here, you know, the more that people work and the more that they're on call, the more likely they are to have sleep deprivation uh, and the more likely this is uh, to, to cause uh, chronic stress. All right, so let's look at mortality. It's something we hope never happens, but we know will always happen, hopefully, uh, later than sooner. We'll look at some overall statistics. We'll particularly talk about issues of suicide and drug addiction. Uh, look at the issues of uh, uh, occupational exposure. 
So we're going to look at the sort of the history of this literature about uh, death, cause of death, and amongst anesthesiologists. And we see from 1930 to 46, and then 47 to 56, things were similar in terms of the rates of death. They actually got better. That is, death rates decreased from 57 to 76 after the introduction of the halogenated anesthetics, which suggests that halogenated anesthetic exposure overall, again, there may be secular changes, but it suggests that halogenated anesthetics are not a problem. This is published in 19. 81 you see here. Uh, now fast forward, if we're looking at experience from 54 to 76, what we do see is that suicide is a problem amongst anesthesiologists, particularly less than age 55. And they said at this time it appeared to be the only major health problem among American anesthesiologists that was greater uh, compared to the rest of the population. And what about coronary artery disease? This is an anesthesiology in 68. While coronary disease is the most common cause of death of anesthesiologists, the overall incidence of, is actually less than it is among a comparable uh, population based on, this was mostly men in the, back in 1968, uh, or a comparable socioeconomic group. And smoking, we know, is rare amongst anesthesiologists, interestingly enough, except for opiate addicts. So that whereas this is the general population, this amount of tobacco use, uh, in physicians in general, and this is physicians with opiate addiction, we see roughly half smoke cigarettes. But otherwise, cigarettes are pretty unusual. Now, some people have actually measured or purported to measure the stress that people feel uh, while they're providing care. Uh, they did some Holter studies. They found the average blood pressure during a clinical day was not different from a non-clinical day. Now, if you remember, at every point in time, marital stress is one of the top three. Okay, so whether you're at work, whether you're, you still have all these other stressors in your life, ultra tapes revealed no rhythm abnormalities, no ischemia. And so these folks said that the practice of anesthesiology is associated only with minor manifestations of acute physiologic stress. I don't know that I would agree with that all the time, uh, but this is what these authors purported. Uh, coming back to cause-specific mortality risk of, of, uh, in anesthesiologists, you see again here, suicide stands out. This is anesthesiologists, and this is internists. And you see, for the most point, at most points, anesthesiologists have two to three times the rate of suicide. And that may be something about us. It also reflects the availability of potent drugs with which that can be activated. Because you see here, the drug-related deaths are significantly increased uh, with anesthesiologists internists. And this is particularly early on. Over time, the difference diminishes. Even here, after 26 years, we still see that it's roughly twice as great. So if we compare anesthesiologists to internists, we see uh, in terms of mortality, cancer is not increased in anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists did have increased risk in terms of death from suicide, suicide by uh, drug overdose often, and drug-related deaths, and all kind of mixed in there. And that this was published in 2000, that male anesthesiologists were more likely to suffer mortality uh, from HIV and viral hepatitis. Well, there are also occupational risks of anesthesia practice, and some of these include drug dependence, their ergonomic risk, radiation risk, infection risk, among others. Uh, how many people have dealt with a colleague in their residency program, academic program, private practice with a drug dependence issue? So almost, I see almost everyone putting uh, their hand up. We know this is an issue. Traditionally, this has been uh, with opiates. Uh, we have now some cases of, of, uh, of propofol, of ketamine, even occasionally volatile anesthetics uh, that have been abused. We know that anesthesiologists are overrepresented. This is Florida, but this is uh, for uh, any uh, state program. You'll basically find that anesthesiologists tend to be treated at about twice the rate that you would be predicted, um, internists less, pediatricians less, and surgeons are treated uh, more than one might expect also. Now, there's a recent theory that suggests that part of the problem of addiction and perhaps relapse in people who are in recovery may relate to occupational exposure. That is, you can actually find that there is aerosolized propofol and fentanyl in the anesthetic circuit, in the air, in the workspace, in the operating room. So this is a hypothesis that has not been proven, but the suggestion that second and third hand drug exposure at very low levels that can be measured may sensitize, you say, yeah, right, give me a break, okay, may sensitize the brain uh, to be, uh, to, to, to make people more susceptible uh, 
uh, to addiction. This is just showing gas, uh, gas chromatography. Uh, examining fentanyl in the air, in the search, in the air, okay? Surgical suite, expiratory limb uh, of the circuit, uh, and above the sharp spot. So you are breathing not just gases, you're breathing the intravenous drugs that you give patients as well. And so they hypothesize that exposure to these drugs in the operating room may be a factor in addiction and relapse. And we see, how many have seen in, in, your, in your practices issues with propofol abuse? Okay, so less than the total number of hands that went up before, but that's something that's happening as well. Now what's controversial is whether anesthesiologists can return uh, after uh, treatment for chemical dependency to the operating room. The pendulum has swung back and forth about this. Uh, early on when the potent uh, synthetic opiates came into practice and these issues with addiction of anesthesia providers was identified, uh, treatment was often provided, people were allowed to come back to work, uh, people had experiences with relapses and deaths even as a result. And there's been a pendulum that swung away from that. You can find really literature on both sides of the argument about whether or not people should return to practice. There's some who recommend that people who've been practicing for a while perhaps be allowed to come back to practice with monitoring and the like for some period of years, whereas should people be detected as abusing during training programs probably uh, might think about finding uh, another uh, a, a field in which to specialize. But this is data from the Mayo Clinic that suggests that when people are supervised and have stringent criteria for reentry, uh, have very good uh, outcome rates without higher mortality, relapse rate, or disciplinary rates. Now I ask for a show of hands. How many of the people have, have had in your practice someone come back to work and had a relapse? Anyone had someone in your practice die as a result of drug overdose? Okay, so a significant number of hands go up. And one of the concerns is that very often the first sign of either addiction or relapse is death. Uh, and, and that's something that's certainly very uh, concerning. There's a nice review of this uh, by Jeff Silverstein uh, and, and his group at Mount Sinai in New York in anesthesiology a couple of years ago. This is also Mount Sinai data. And you can decide whether or not you think this favors or not having people come back. Small number of five residents participated in the program. Three successfully at 60% completed their residency and a five-year monitoring contract. So you can decide for yourself whether or not you think someone in this situation should return to finish an anesthesia residency and practice. Uh, certainly the results of a survey of anesthesiologists uh, in the upper Midwest suggested uh, a relative lack of support uh, for someone in that scenario uh, coming back into practice. Now, you know, I served for a number of years at the University of Chicago on what had been called the Impaired Physicians uh, Committee and then became the Physicians Co Assistance Committee because we ended up dealing with many issues. I would say half of the issues we dealt with were drug and alcohol issues, but there were the issues of the older person who perhaps was having cognitive impairment, the person who had a medical issue and was trying to come back to work and the question is whether they were competent either cognitively or physically as a proceduralist. Uh, the, some of the more difficult issues that we would deal with were the anger management issues that you're all familiar with. You know, it, can, can this person come and get, you know, we, we no longer at least in, in the university setting tolerate people throwing instruments uh, and, and that sort of thing. Under what circumstances do you allow people to return to work uh, after bad behavior? And the ASA has a whole website about this about the disabled anesthesiologists, and they talk about uh, any number of these issues, so you can reference that website into your handout, uh, should you wish. Now, I'm well familiar, I'm going to shift here from issues of addiction uh, and, and those other sorts of impairments to talk about ergonomic risk, infectious risk, and radiation risk. And uh, we are ergonomic risk. I've, I've shared with a number of people, I've had a number of cervical discectomies. I know at least 30 anesthesiologists that have cervical discectomies. This, I think, is an occupational hazard. In fact, proceduralists tend to have issues. I mean, urologists, car you know, invasive cardiologists, people who are looking at scopes and looking at screens tend to have neck. Healthcare providers in general tend to have back issues, and we'll look a bit at little of this. Now, this is just a survey in nurses. I mean, being a floor nurse and having back pain almost seem to be synonymous. And the fact that our patients are getting bigger and bigger does not help. Survey in China. 
More than half of the nurses said they had low back problems, 42% neck problems, shoulder, and upper back. Now, if you survey surgeons who do laparoscopic surgeries, they have the stuff in spades. In fact, you see these articles that say, you know, laparoscopic surgery, it's a patient's benefit, the surgeons suffer. Laparoscopic surgeons have tremendous complaints related uh, to doing these things. In fact, one of my young uh, colleagues was, was formerly a resident and said one of the reasons she became a trauma surgeon is because it was just too difficult for her to do laparoscopic surgery ergonomically. We have these issues, too, in, in how we practice. So, for example, if we look at the ergonomics involved in doing an ultrasound-guided femoral nerve block. And this is a study from Ireland. And they compared how residents did and how attendings did. Now, one of my residents, one of my attendings at the University of Virginia, Bob Bedford, uh, was a wonderful teacher. And one of the things that Bedford did to me, and, and, and as a big guy, and he would just take me, he put his hands on my shoulders. You can't do this today, right? You get, you, you get arrested if you do this. And he'd say, Ellis, you need to be here. He would physically move me around. You need to be here so you can see the suction canister and see the screen without doing all this crazy stuff. And yet we see here, trainees have poor ergonomics. Do you put the ultrasound machine in front of you? Makes sense, right? If you're an experienced operator, you do that. If you're a novice operator, you got the ultrasound machine here and you're doing this. Not good, okay? Are you flexing your thumb, the thoracolumbar area more than 45%, right? If you're a trainee, yes. If you're experienced, no. Uh, what about the cervical spine? You know, you're, you're, you're twisting this thing out. So one of the things, and this is experienced people don't do that so much, so one of the things if you're training people is you want to train them in ergonomics. One of the things I always tell trainees is either raise the bed to intubate or sit down to intubate. But do try as much as you can to get things at a level that is ergonomically uh, comfortable for you. This is certainly an issue with intubation, and most people have very bad positioning uh, during uh, tracheal intubation. Now, to the extent that you know, we end up uh, uh, you know, needing bifocals and trifocals over time, that doesn't help as well, and, and, and these are problematic. Now, certainly some of the uh, newer devices for tracheal intubation may help with some of that. And we see this with surgeons here, too. This is, a very tip. This is uh, a, a, an article from Dermatologic Surgery talking about bone surgery. But do you see yourself here? Do you see yourself here all day long, right? Neck down, uh, looking at things. Uh, not good in the long run as well. What else is bad? Increasingly, we go to interventional radiology. We're doing cases in the OR where we have to wear lead. Now, when you go to, so the things that bother people, lead aprons, the most footwear, other, some people have no complaints. Now, when you go down to do that case in IR, or when you go to radiology, or you go to the cardiac cath lab or electrophysiology, the people that work there have those nice, light lead, have their favorite baseball team on it, have their name, they have the good lead, right? You get there, they got the 50-year-old lead that weighs 50 pounds, in my case, it usually comes up to about here. It's a problem for me. Ooh. Let's get that rain out of the way before the sale. So this is increasingly a problem as we do more cases uh, with radiology. Radiation exposure is an issue, particularly for us in ways we may not think about. In the neurointerventional suite, we see here one study that the anesthesiologist's face got six-fold greater radiation during angiography and threefold greater than that of the radiologist. Okay? Anesthesiologists who spend significant time in such procedures should wear protective eyewear. How many of you go to radiology and wear protective eyewear? How many of you wear neck thyroid shields? How many of you go down there and they can't find the thyroid shield for you? Right? But if you're going to be working in neuroradiology in these, in these interventional suites a lot, you need to think about these issues of your own radiation safety. Now, I'll skip through this slide here. Infection risks uh, are, are, are also an issue in the situations in which we work. This is an interesting study from Israel. They actually had a strike. Now, could you imagine going out on strike here in the U.S.? And I think, the, is anyone, they've been striking in British Columbia, haven't they? There have been some work issues in British Columbia. But 
Anesthesiologist in Israel went on strike for a period of three months. And so there wasn't a lot of surgery done. They weren't working a lot. And if you look at stress in terms of pro-inflammatory cytokines, they actually went down. So one of the ways that we may be prone to infectious risk, this may be a little bit of a jump, is the fact that when we are stressed at work, uh, we are actually more set up uh, to have infections. So, so we'll close here with some suggestions of tools to combat stress and reduce chronic disease uh, other than being in St. Thomas. Now, you know, it's funny. I let Dr. Royzen, I did my fellowship with Dr. Royzen. Uh, I used my chairman for 15 years. Uh, I have to laugh sometimes at, the, at seeing him as medical director of the Dr. Oz show and this and that. But he says some things that I think are very reasonable and not necessarily original. A number of things uh, that can be done. I summarize some things here from the surgical literature. Number one, identify personal values and priorities. Right? We were all a people before we become anesthesiologists or nurse anesthetists. To the extent possible, enhance areas of work that are personally meaningful. So if I was talking to at the, at the, at the cocktail party last night to a fellow from Los Angeles who says, you know, he did cardiac anesthesia for 10 years. He kind of decided he didn't like doing that anymore. He now does orthopedic anesthesia. He said he does nothing gives him more pleasure than to put in a block, have someone have three hours of, you know, doing a whole rotator cuff repair and at the end of it look like they had a haircut. So nothing gives them greater pleasure. If you can match what you enjoy with what you're doing on a daily basis, you're going to be happier. Things that are outside of work that can nurture wellness strategies, including our relationships with our families, spiritual hobbies, uh, rest and reflection and self-care, which were reasons that we're here. Um, I'll just close with a few comments about myself. Uh, folks who've seen me over the years, as Dr. Moitra can tell you, when I was at the University of Chicago, they used to call me Big Daddy. Uh, I have managed to, to lose some weight, so I'm happy to share any of, of that experience with folks who may be interested. But I can tell you that working at the hospital where you are captive, where it's hard to plan when you're going to eat, and then suddenly when you do get broken out, you go out, and this is the food that's out there, right? Whatever rep has come, if they still, do you still have rep bringing stuff in your hospital? Right? You come, now who brings the best stuff? The, the, the ortho implant people? Right? But that, that food is fair game for everyone. Uh, and, and, and this is a real problem. Now, now, outside of medicine anesthesia, but just in general, if you look at the work situations that tend to result in increased obesity, they are the combination of low control over decisions and high demand. Those people are more likely to become obese. So if you have a job where you have low control and low psychological demands, you're passive, right? I don't know what that would be. That'd be night watchman, right? No one's stressing you really. You don't have to make a whole lot of decisions. Okay, passive. Now here, how about this? This is you have lots of decisions to make, but no one's really beating on you. That's easy. Now, here is where I hope we function, right? We have high psychological demands, that is clear. And that we are making decisions about what we're doing. So, we control, we have a lot of difficult decisions to make, but we're making the decisions. The things that are particularly problematic is this high strain quadrant. We have high psychological demands, right? Start this case but someone's trying to take the decision away from you. The glucose is 350, you don't want to do it, and someone's trying to force you to do it. These are, these are the stressors that are particularly associated with developing obesity over time. Uh, watching TV ain't the answer. Uh, we have now data from, I mean, it's certainly nice to go home at the end of the day and plop in front of the couch. We got data uh, from uh, Australia that says, number one, the more TV you watch, and I don't know if anyone here has time to watch more than four hours a day of TV, the more TV you watch, you're more likely to be obese, but not only that, the more TV you watch, the more likely you are to die. Okay? That may be association that people who are sickly sit and watch more TV, but TV is certainly not the answer. So anyway, what did I do? This is me, and I got bigger than that, and now I'm here. Hopefully I'll stay here. Uh, you know, I got rid of these nasty things. Uh, take the stairs. Who takes the stairs at work? Beautiful thing to do. Who does not take stairs at work? Don't raise your hand. 
right? I tell people start now, one up, two down. Take the flight. If you can't go up to seven steps, seven flights, take one flight up, right? Two flights down, work your way up. Next thing you'll be doing. Weight training has been key. And, and I take these supplements. I'm not repping any of them, but they've been useful for me. And if anyone you're interested in, in how this whole process is going, I have a website here, uh, which I don't make any money off of. In fact, I pay money to run. But it makes me feel good as a teacher, uh, as a physician, uh, to share some uh, health issues and, and some tips that have worked for me on, on obesity and weight loss. But in fact, a lot of what has helped me do that has been incorporating these other things about stress reduction uh, into my life. So I will stop at this point, and I'm happy to take questions. I will tell you that Dr. Brian Ginsberg from Duke has been kind enough uh, to, number one, I'm volunteering him to pass the magic microphone, but number two, he's going to wind up the day for us uh, by doing a little case uh, presentation, as we promised, to the end of each day. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Yeah, I just have one kind of sort of a little bit uh, relevant, I thought, to this. I don't know if everybody probably knows that the three A's of anesthesiology or anesthesia and the four A's of surgery, the three A's of anesthesiology in, uh, are important in order of importance are availability, equability, and ability, according to surgeons. And the surgeons are above average, arrogant, a hole. It's a joke. Any surgeons in the audience? Every now and then we get a we, we get a surgeon in the audience here, so we don't. Questions, comments? A question for me while I'm walking. Uh, shorter breath, I need more exercise. Uh, the something that occurs in with a lot of our anesthesia providers, we go to work in the dark, we come home in the dark. And we know so much about a light as being important for well-being. How do we work on that? Well, I think that's a real issue. That's probably why the people who work, you see that work hours, right, are a predictor of burnout. And that's probably part of it in addition to the stress. Now, you know, I, I liken the OR to the casino. The lights are always on and there's oxygen in the air. Um, having said that, I can tell you what, how many of you work in operating rooms where there are windows? Don't you love that when you have that opportunity? I remember when I was a resident at the University of Virginia, half of the ORs had windows. They built a new hospital, they got rid of it. Worst thing in the world. It, it, it gives you a connection to what's outside. But that's clearly one of the risks that we have in our practice. The good thing is, despite those issues, despite the stress, despite the suicide, our mortality rates are equivalent to other physicians, if not better, and equivalent, if not better, to people of similar socioeconomic status in the society. So everyone sort of gets their pound of flesh taken out. But uh, in the end, despite this, we do relatively well. Yes, sir? Um, is there an increased incidence among anesthesiologists among traffic accidents after post due to post call fatigue? Uh, you know, I certainly have fallen asleep at a red light after being on call. Having said that, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, has anyone else fallen asleep driving home from being post-call? Okay, so there we go. Now, one of the questions you, you got to ask then is, you know, that's likely sleep deprivation from being on call. There was, a published, there was a study published in JAMA just about a month ago in policemen that said that, you know, a third of policemen have sleep apnea, and I'm not suggesting that's the case for folks falling asleep after being on call. And those people that had sleep apnea reported much more likelihood, much greater likelihood of making errors in their police work uh, as a result, not surprising. Uh, and so that certainly, I mean, what's interesting is that we now have 80-hour work rules for residents and what that means in academic training programs is that the attendings now get to work more. The attendings get to relieve residents so that they can go home and stay within their 80-hour work rule. And yet we have older people who are presumably perhaps somewhat fossilized. And, and, and you know, I mean, there are good things about fossilization because, you know, you work more automatically, right? You know what to do. At least we think we know what to do. But the question is, who should be working on less sleep? 
the 28-year-old or the 58-year-old? You said neither? So, so the question is interesting because, you know, when I've gone to Europe, and perhaps you can comment on this, Lawrence, perhaps you can comment on this internationally, I remember going to Spain, it was fairly typical in academic programs to have one attending supervising one resident. And that's just not a model that we do in the United States. And some of that has to do uh, with remuneration. So, I mean, we could work less. We could work 40 hours a week. And that would have some consequences for us. All right. Well, we'll get Brian up here. And uh, we'll do our case presentation. And hopefully that rain is finished. And we'll carry on with our day. doing this so I never came prepared with my little table so this is from the head okay a scenario a, a case that occurred a few 